At the West Cork History Festival, one of the things we always try to achieve is being grounded here in West Cork, but looking out into the world. And this year we think we achieved that in a piece that Bob Geldof came to record for us. We think it's one of the best and most interesting things we've done. One of the most important documents written during the famine period was a letter written from Reen Farm, which is very close to here. And Bob Geldof came to Reen Farm and he read the letter and he gave his reflections on famine, famine then and famine now. And that's the film you're about to see. I'm in Reen Farm, which is an extraordinary place that was happened upon by John and Christine Kelly in a series of bizarre coincidences and chance, or maybe not, that led them here over time. And it is the site of not just great physical beauty, but also great past horror. And I've said before when here that you are filled with um, a sense of absence. I'm going to amend that because just walking through this magnificent sky garden and seeming tombs, this great work of art that he's made out of his whole home, that while there is that felt and palpable absence, there also is concomitantly a great sense of presence and maybe John and Christine have made that presence appear and I'm not one for the karmic ragtag and bobtail as I say um, maybe there are no ghosts knocking at John's brain or on the farmhouse door and saying we were here and this is where we died in utter degradation and horror. And uh, frankly, I'm reminded as this work continues and seems to consume this family, um, quite rightly, I've been to many of the Holocaust Memorial Museums throughout the world. And gradually more and more, again, by a seeming weird chain of coincidence and chance, the artworks that John has uh, made over the course of years, s without seeming reference to each other, there's a, there's a mini version of the modern Tate Museum in London there. And this ancient, almost, um, these dolmens, these, these sort of Tara in miniature that he created for his birthday. I'm not sure that's what happened, but they seem to be uniting now in some sort of bizarre common purpose in memory of the small houses that dotted this farm, of the hundreds of people who died here. And it seems to me that I'm getting the same sensation as when I visit those more studied pieces of art that are the memorials to the Holocaust. And quite rightly, that word is overused, and quite rightly, Jews feel a sense of ownership of that great horror and that word which should only describe their particular suffering, the Shoah. This wasn't the Irish Shoah. It wasn't some planned, mad, scientific, racist thing. This was a combination of bureaucratic inertia, confusion, agricultural failure, a, a social system that just simply couldn't deal in the course of three or four years with the decimation of the Irish population, a reduction by 50%, which in anybody's language must be deemed a holocaust, just sweeping through a land and taking the people, their language, and all that vast culture away from them. And it was noted by the people around them. It wasn't ignored by anyone, which is part of the oddness of this terror. And one of the people who couldn't turn away was one of the worthies of the town, one of the few middle class of the town, a justice of the peace. And he seems to me to be a very modern man. 
it's a bit embarrassing that it's me talking about this, but I pointed out to the West Cork History Festival people that this man, this good man, N.M. Cummings, this Justice of the Peace, had written his letter to the London Times on Christmas Eve, 1846. And all the language of this letter and the people to whom he addresses and the sort of moral arm lock he puts on them is very reminiscent to me of that time in 1984 when we were alerted to the great African famines, which lasted more or less the same period of time and which wasn't as devastating as what happened to the Irish in terms of numbers or indeed in terms of uh, the cultural meaning. Cummings wrote this on Christmas Eve. What Band-Aid tried to do was to use the notion of Christmas, where we become expansive, where we exchange gifts, where we open up to others, where we do begin to notice the homeless, or where we do begin to invite people into our homes, where families make up and break up again, where old enmities should be put to rest, even if they're revived again a week later. And he's using that time, and he's appealing to the leaders of that country and saying, I'm writing to you directly. There's no turning away now from the civil service reports. I'm telling you boldly, and I am substantial. I am a minister of the court. And I'm telling you this is what's happening. And I can only tell you in as bold, as vulgar, as awful a way I can. And he's asking their forgiveness, but he's also saying to him, if you can do this, this will surpass everything achieved in a life of achievement. And we have a young queen, and she is a woman, and she must not and will not turn away. I've subsequently learned that within two weeks of this letter being printed in the Times, and this is another significant factor, like in 1984, there was now a global medium. The Times had become a significant channel of communication with everybody at this stage. Newspapers were a mass medium for the first time almost. So this man Cummings, out of Skibbereen County Cork, knew exactly what he was doing. And two weeks after this letter, at this time of the year, to these people, the Queen started the British Relief Association with £20,000, which was effective. In one of the reports I was reading just this morning, um, a lot of the relief for a certain period came through that organisation. Of course, we subsequently know what happened and it's resonated palpably, palpably down all these years, so that the Irish in principle in general respond almost like, again, not particularly one of those things I believe in, a folk memory kicks in. But being here on this sacred and hallowed ground where John and Christine are trying to find the names of the people here, remember them, etch them in stone, place them in the ground upon which they lie. Then as I say, they are absent. They were absent within their own lifetimes, but they're coming back. They are not forgotten. Their presence becomes more and more real. That is not only something wholly desirable, it is something classically historical. And I hope people aren't offended by this, but it is a great work of art because it is what art does. It enables humanity because humans at their ultimate are creatives. They're using this, if only this appeal to this had worked in 1846. This is the text of N.M. Cummins' letter published in the Times on Christmas Eve, 1946. And it's addressed to that most eminent of Irish Englishmen, the Duke of Wellington. To His Grace, Field Marshal, the Duke of Wellington. My Lord Duke, without apology or preface, 
I presume so far to trespass on your grace as to state to you and by the use of your illustrious name to present to the British public the following statement of what I myself have seen within the last three days. Having for many years been connected with the western portion of the county of Cork and possessing some small property there, I thought it right personally to investigate the truth of the several lamentable accounts which had reached me of the appalling state of misery to which that part of the country was reduced. I accordingly went on the 15th inst to Skibbereen, and to give the instance of one townland which I visited, as an example of the state of the entire coast district, I shall state simply what I there saw. It is situated on the eastern side of Castlehaven Harbour and is named South Ream in the parish of Myros. Being aware that I should have to witness scenes of frightful hunger, I provided myself with as much bread as five men could carry, and on reaching the spot, I was surprised to find the wretched hamlet apparently deserted. I entered some of the hovels to ascertain the cause, and the scenes that presented themselves were such no tongue or pen can convey the slightest idea of. In the first six famished and scarcely skeletons, to all appearance dead, were huddled in a corner on some filthy straw, their soul covering what seemed a ragged horse cloth naked above the knees. I approached in horror, and found by a low moaning they were alive. They were in fever, four children, a woman, and what, what had once been a man. It is impossible to go through the details. Suffice to say that in a few minutes I was surrounded by at least two hundred of such phantoms, such frightful spectres as no words can describe. By far the greater number were delirious, either from famine or fever. Their demonic yells are still yelling in my ears and their horrible images are fixed upon my brain. My heart sickens at the recital, but I must go on. In another case, decency would forbid what follows, but it must be told, my clothes were nearly torn off in my endeavours to escape from the throng of pestilence around when my neckcloth was seized from behind by a grip which compelled me to turn. I found myself grasped by a woman with an infant just born in her arms and the remains of a filthy sack across her loins, the sole covering of herself and babe. The same morning the police, opening a house on the adjoining lands which was observed shut for many days, and two frozen corpses were found lying upon the mud floor, half devoured by the rats. A mother, herself in fever, was seen the same day to drag out the corpse of her child, a girl of about eleven, perfectly naked, and leave it half covered with stones. In another house, within five hundred yards of the cavalry station at Skibbereen, the dispensary doctor found seven wretches lying, unable to move under the same cloak. One had been dead for many hours, but the others were unable to move themselves or the corpse. To what purpose should I multiply such cases? If these be not sufficient, neither would they here who has the power to send relief and do not, even though one came from the dead. Let them, however, believe and tremble that they shall one day hear the judge of all the earth pronounce their tremendous doom with the addition. I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat thirsty, and you gave me no drink, naked, and he clothed me not. But I forget to whom this is addressed. My Lord, you are an old and justly honoured man. It is yet in your power to add other honour to your age, to fix another star, and that the brightest in your galaxy of glory. You have access to our young and gracious Queen. Lay these things before her. She is a woman. She will not allow decency to be outraged. She has at her command the means of at least mitigating the suffering of the wretched survivors in this tragedy. They will soon be few indeed in the district I speak of if help be longer withheld. Once more, my Lord Duke, in the name of starving thousands, I implore you, break the frigid and flimsy chain of official etiquette and save the land of your birth 
the kindred of the gallant Irish blood which you have so often seen lavished to support the honour of the British name, and let there be inscribed upon your tomb, Stervata Hibernia. I have the honour to be, my Lord Duke, your Grace's obedient humble servant, N. M. Cummins, J. P. and Mount Cork, December 17th, 1846.